Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Nicholas today to be on the podcast. Very special episode for the future hour. And Nicholas is an Oracle Core Unit Facilitator from MakerDAO. Thank you so much for taking the time. Hey, great, great to be here. Thank you,、uh, thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. So usually when we have very unique and fascinating guests on the podcast, I usually begin with something a little bit challenging, which is. Nicholas, we might share a story that led you into the crypto rabbit hole, or how did crypto change your life?、Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot to unpack there.、Um, I I actually got into crypto in a in kind of a funny way.、Um, so I was right out of college. I had just started a job at IBM,、um, and they had put me working on.、Uh, Operating systems for mainframes, right? Mainframes, right, being like kind of computers from like the fifties and the sixties, right? And after two weeks, I went to my boss and I was like, "I don't want to do this."、Um, and at first, I was kind of terrified that、uh, you know you should not tell your boss that, right? Um, but、uh, no, my boss was a very understanding guy, and then he was like, "Look, I hired you to do this, right? And I, I need someone to do that. But、uh, if there's anything else that uh, you know uh, you want to work on <clears throat> with another team with maybe half of your time,、um, you know, we can find you something." So I was I was really lucky to have a, a manager who was very understanding, and、uh, so I was like, "All right, well, like, what what kind of stuff?" Like cool stuff, do you have to work on, right? And he's like, "Well, we're doing some stuff with AI. We're doing like machine learning. We're doing blockchain." I'm like, "Oh, blockchain sounds interesting. Why don't I try that?" So I、uh, was working fifty fifty with this team in IBM that was doing a、uh, doing blockchain. They had totally missed the boat on cloud, right? So Microsoft and Google. Uh, you know, an Amazon, right? Especially Amazon had totally beaten them to the punch on cloud, and so their executive team was、uh, and board was very upset. And so they said, the next thing that comes along, we're going to be first. We're just going to go、uh, throw tons of money at it. And、uh, so that that was blockchain for IBM.、Um, so,、uh, but unfortunately. Uh, their interpretation of what blockchain was was a kind of a, an enterprise blockchain, so it was called Hyperledger,、um, and it was right、uh, a permission chain, right? So、uh, it's not like you and I could access this chain. It's like a walled garden, right? We only let in who we want to let in. Only certain people can see the data. It's not transparent, right?、Um, but you know.、Uh, To me, right, I was like, okay, this is cool, whatever.、And、then the Ethereum white paper came out, and I was like, oh well, we've gotten it all wrong. You know, this is like what we should be doing, right?、Um, so I went to my my other manager, my my blockchain manager. I was like, look, look at this thing. This is、um, this is like more what we should be doing. Like, you know, or maybe we should even just like stop what we're working on and just use this instead, right? Uh, we should help them work on this, and and they they kind of laughed at me. They was like, "Shut the fuck up, right?" Uh, sorry, sorry. I, I don't know if I can swear on here.、I'll、no, no, of course, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Authentic, all good. <laughs> They're、um, like, "Yes, but no, Nicholas." Yeah, exactly. Like that. That's cute,、right. right? Yeah. Oh.、Uh, so so six months later,、uh, Ethereum mainnet comes out. And I and I go back to my boss and I'm like, no, 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 it's not fake, it's real. Look at it, like you can you can play with it, right? And they're like, shut up. <laughs>、um, so so I I was very excited about about Ethereum and and I knew I wanted to work on it, so I started looking into well, what are what are the different projects, right? And at the time, because Ethereum was so new, there weren't very many projects, right? Um, a lot of people, kind of hobbyists, you know, working on something cool, but no one who had, you know, some funding who could, you know, pay me to、yeah. to code, right? Like as、nice. a job. 
yeah uh, that, 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 that's the difference between like a hobby right and a job like you know they pay you yeah yeah uh, and, and there just weren't that many options so there were there were three total projects on ethereum there was uh digix dow right uh, so digix right they had a they were making a stable coin backed by you know gold yeah. right uh, redeemable for gold um there was augur which was a predictions market and then there was MakerDAO. And uh, so I tried to interview a Digix. They're like, we, we don't hire Americans. They, right, they were based out of, I, I think, Singapore. And uh, they were like, you know, we, we only want people in our time zone who can come into our office. I interviewed at Augur and I didn't make the cut. And uh, then I was like, okay, well, Maker's the last option. And I, and I don't really understand it. Like, I know they're like, making some like a stable coin that sounds really cool but i don't really get how it works i don't know if it makes any sense but i i went to interview there and uh, the guy looked at me like interview what do you mean interview like you want to work on it you're hired right and uh so that was uh that was an interesting experience and uh now i was apparently hired on this team and i didn't even understand what the hell this thing was that we were building but and I felt like the uh, the dumbest person on the team. But uh, ev- evidently, uh, I, I eventually learned, and uh, the team got it right. Right, uh, you know, Dai has uh, seen amazing product market fit and amazing adoption in the past uh, five or so years. Right, um, so I think uh, I kind of lucked into uh, lucked into the this. Uh, uh, the the crypto rabbit hole, right? There are quite a few things I would like to to elaborate on. That what was the first day, for example, or the first week was like? Uh, was like because when you mentioned that they just like, oh, what do you mean by interview? You want to work on it? Let's go. Just you are hired. What was that first day or first week like? Uh, the first day was actually a really funny story because uh, they were like, "Nick, you're in luck. You know, we've uh, we're all meeting up for the first time. You know, we've never met each other before, right? And uh, so you're gonna get to meet everyone on the team. So on the first day of work, I flew out to the Bahamas to wow. go meet with the rest of the maker team. So yeah. uh, that was a that's a nice way to to start a new job." Um, and ironically enough, right, I, uh, I, I told you earlier, I just had my, um, my team's offsite in Curacao last week, and uh, we, uh, we had someone start uh, their first day of work on the first day of the offsite in Curacao. So uh, in- interesting, interesting parallels there. It's like coming full circle, right? And, yeah. um, and, uh, and, I, and I'm looking to hire someone else later this week, and uh, if, if I can... Uh, finagle the starting date right like i want to make their first date in uh, in devcon in bogota in a few weeks oh that would be very nice i think there's something powerful with meeting in person and yeah. get to know each other on a very subtle level that maybe you'll get lunch together or go to go for a walk in the jungle together or go for a swim together that you yeah like unpack more layer of the person than just only meeting online although Nowadays, so much of our time is spending in front of a computer mm-hmm. and then chatting, reach consensus in front of a computer, right? But I think that's something that's still very powerful. And, you know, maybe that's one reason we travel so much. Yeah, no, no, I agree, especially for remote teams, right? Um, so, uh, like most projects in the space, right? Uh, Maker doesn't have an office. Right, uh, we we all work remote, you know, from uh, from home or you know wherever we we happen to be, um, and uh, you know, you can say that makes it uh, the working style a little bit different, right? It's asynchronous. When you are available, maybe the, a team member that you need something from is not available, right? And so the working style kind of changes, right? Uh, you uh, have to have a lot more things like documentation. Right, because you might not have a person available to uh, give you the answer right when you need it. So uh, you really need to go really, really heavy on documentation. So uh, no one is kind of blocking uh, productivity. Uh, 
But the other thing is something that you touched on, right? That meeting in person, uh, you really build much more of a connection with someone uh, and and trust in in an individual, right? And a real relationship than when you're just kind of across from each other on a screen. Um, and so for a, for a small team, um, you, you run on trust, right? So trust is, uh, is as useful as, as gold, right? In a, in a larger corporation, right? Large corporations don't run on trust, right? They run on process. They have very formal defined processes and anyone that they hire, right? They just slot into the process, right? And they've created like an industrial machine for creating, you know, code or creating products. Right. In a in a smaller team, um, it's it's less formalized, right? And so uh, you really want to trust, uh, you know, from a management perspective, you want to trust the people that you hire. Um, but from an operational uh, perspective, you want everyone to trust each other. Absolutely, and even how we have met that story, right? Mm -hmm. We met. Kind of like super, actually super shortly because at the time I remember you were talking with some of the folks at the event and we're in Subgetti in Milan, which uh, hosted by one of our dear friend Maria. And I think I was leaving, taking a break for lunch, and but we, I, I managed to get a hold of you. I was like, Nicholas, we got to chat, we got to go grab wine or a coffee or whatever. And I actually stayed a little bit longer uh, after the event in Milan and we get to have a coffee and then later uh, some wine at um, a very nice uh, restaurant, which is around that time you just moved to Milan, right? So mm -hmm. coming back a little bit further, right? Meeting in person and managing a team or a small team, right? could you share a little bit about that with um, your experience, what you're doing now? What is it like to um, now managing your team and how big is your team? So the team is up to eight, and uh, but we have uh, funding to get uh, to fifteen within the next six months. So it's uh, um, any anyone can tell you right who's uh, tried to to run a business before right. Uh, it uh, it changes um, considerably the depending on your size right. So uh, processes that. Um, I'd like the difference between small, medium, and, and large companies, right, are, are the processes that you use. So someone coming from a big corporate, right, where you have really, uh, you know, large scale processes, if you try to apply those to a very small startup, they're not going to work or they're, there's too much overhead, right? They're, they're overbearing and they, they constrict you instead of enabling you. But uh, the opposite is true as well. Right. So when you have internal processes and they work great for a team of, you know, five, six, seven, um, as soon as you grow to say, you know, that 11, 12, 13, 14 mark, uh, things start to break, right? It's like a, it's like a pipe kind of bursting, right? And, uh, so you need to retool your, your processes, right? And, uh, you know, I, I saw this within Maker as well, right? Uh, so the processes that you use for 15, between 15 and 20 people are very different than the ones that you use with 60 or with 150, right? And so you really, uh, the, the, that, that's, I think, one of the most important things that I, that I learned kind of at Maker is, uh, you know, I, I was there from the beginning when we were, uh, you know, just a handful to, you know, at our maximum when we were like 150 and just kind of seeing all of those intermediate steps and, uh, you know, what, uh, what, uh, functions you, uh, you start needing at different sizes and, and what processes you need. I, I think that was kind of the most valuable, uh, thing that I, that I took away from there. Absolutely. Appreciate that. And really we're talking about this journey that from you years ago, five, six years ago, the first day at Maker DAO, and now as the Oracle core, core unit facilitator, now you're managing your own team, the things you have learned, the lessons you have learned, which I think those are super valuable, right? Could you, again, we talk about this in person, but could you mention or explain a bit the audience that work you're working on now as 
the Oracle Core Unit Facilitator, what you have planned for us, mm -hmm. obviously the things that you can mention. Should be a little bit uh, obvious by the name, right? Uh, the Oracle Core Unit, we, we tend to work on oracles, right? Uh, and uh, I think traditionally, oracles in the crypto space have been seen as, uh, you know, uh, something that tells you the price of something else. Um, and while I would say that's a very useful kind of Oracle, I think it, uh, um, is a little bit too narrow of, a, of, of a perspective, right? Uh, the way that I see oracles is that, uh, blockchains are like a black box, right? Uh, they are like a little independent network and they cannot kind of communicate with the outside world. Right. And so when applications need data, um, they, they cannot just, you know, go to Google, uh, to be like, you know, Hey, Google, give me this data, right. Or they cannot, uh, just connect to, to some API. Right. And so oracles are the infrastructure that allows this tunneling of data from outside of a blockchain to a blockchain. And so that allows you to make uh, applications that are very uh, that are much smarter, right? Because uh, they can uh, make decisions based off of external stimuli, right? Um, so th that uh, has manifested itself, right, into not just bringing you know off-chain information onto a blockchain like Ethereum. But now, uh, kind of uh, has evolved into uh, kind of cross-chain communication, right? How does one blockchain talk with another blockchain, right? Um, and uh, I, I think colloquially, right, we have talked about this in the context of bridges, right? Oh, you can bridge your Ethereum from the Ethereum chain to Optimism, right? Or you can send your DAI from Polygon, right, to Binance Smart Chain, right? Um, but again, the bridge is uh, is a little bit too too narrow of a definition, right? Because uh, um, bridge seems to indicate, uh, or at least uh, what we've seen on the application side is uh, people think tokens, right? You bridge tokens from one chain to another. But these, to these tokens are just data, right? So it's really just um, one blockchain telling another blockchain, hey, something happened here, right? Uh, and the right now, the something that happened is this user wants to transfer, you know, 100 DAI from my chain to your chain, right? But the something happened could be anything, right? Um, so I like to think of this, for example, in the context of, of Maker, right? Uh, Please. What if you had a cross-chain maker, right? You had maker on every chain, but instead of being independent kind of systems, it's really just one big system. And what can you do when you have these systems connected with kind of cross-blockchain communication is uh, you, can, you can do a lot of things, right? So say you have a, a, make, a loan on maker open on StarkNet. Right, uh, but you have some die on Arbitrum, and you would like to pay back your loan. You can just pay your die back on Arbitrum, right? And the cross-chain oracle will let the Starknet instance of Maker know, right, that you've paid back your loan, right? And now you can release your collateral. Um, but maybe you don't want to get your collateral on Starknet. Maybe you'd like to get your receive your collateral on Ethereum. Right. And that's, again, just a cross chain message of, hey, maker Ethereum, like release, you know, some amount of ETH uh, to, to you. Right. Um, you can do the same thing, for example, with uh, liquidations. Right. So on maker, if the collateral backing alone uh, drops in price, right, you may need to liquidate. Right. Because the loan might go insolvent. Well, does the loan need to get liquidated on the chain where the loan was made? Probably not, right? Uh, you could say that, uh, well, it's better for the user, right? Uh, the, the, the borrower, right? If the liquidation happens on the chain where there is the most liquidity for their given collateral type, 
right? So um, ETH has a lot of the Ethereum chain has a lot of liquidity on Ethereum. But maybe you, you know, in the previous example, right, you had your loan on StarkNet. But maybe liquidity on StarkNet is quite bad, right? So if we liquidated on StarkNet, you would get a bad price during the liquidation. And that would mean that you as the, the borrower, you got less Ethereum back, right? Using a cross-chain, you know, Oracle, you can say, hey, maker, liquidate this on the Ethereum chain or, you know, not on StarkNet, right? And so... Uh, you as the, the borrower, right? Better liquidity on Ethereum uh, means your liquidation auction gets a better price on Ethereum, means you get more Ethereum back, right? And, and so that's just kind of within the context of, of Maker, right? But you see that, uh, you know, dApps being able to communicate across chains, it's going to be a very, very powerful uh, primitive. And so people Absolutely. need to start realizing, right, that uh, this is all just oracles. Right, and so what they've uh, thought of uh, as putting oracles in this little box of just being prices, right? That's that's wrong. It's uh, really about um, just making data pipelines from one blockchain to to anywhere else. I think that's a great example that you gave there, and a great way to understand it. Is there like um, specific? applications that you that you have in mind or some partner that you have in mind or what kind of impact that you wish you and your team going to leave to this world let's say i don't know a year from now on or a year and a half or two years or maybe even five years from now on i i mean i can give you the zoomed in view and the zoomed out view so uh zoomed in uh right now we are in the process of releasing uh the first stage of this cross chain, this cross blockchain kind of communication um, protocol that I was just talking about. Uh, so it's going to be used uh, in something called Maker Teleport. And so Maker Teleport allows you to bridge your DAI from any chain to any other chain that, that Maker Teleport supports. And uh, what's cool about this is uh, that Usually for something like Optimism or Arbitrum, uh, there is a, like a one week delay, right? Um, and that is because optimistic rollups, right? <clears throat> They're optimistic, right? So they need to have a period where uh, fraud can kind of be called out. And that period is, uh, is, is kind of configured to be one week, right? So you don't have finality um, until one week later. And that's Which a lot of things could happen in one week. Exactly. Right. right? Um, so that's not ideal. Right. So people would love to just transfer their, you know, uh, die instantly. Um, and there's currently bridges that let you do that. Right. Uh, so um, you can pay a fee. Right. And uh, if provided, there is liquidity on the chain that you're trying to go to, right? That, uh, so uh, this is a bridge protocol and there are LPs, right? Just like Uniswap, there are people providing liquidity and uh, the bridge charges the user a fee to use the bridge and the fees go to the LPs. Well, so you can do it quickly, but one, right? The fees are expensive, right? Uh, and two, it's constrained by the liquidity being available, right? Um, the maker teleport doesn't have any of those limitations. So one, it's free. There's no fee. Uh, well, how can we make it free? Like, uh, how do we pay the LPs if, uh, there's no fees? Uh, there's no LPs. There doesn't need to be. The maker protocol has the ability to mint die. Right. Um, and if it knows that in a week, in a week, right. Uh, it will receive die. Right, then it can issue, and but until that week, right, that die is frozen, then it can issue new die, right, and it's backed essentially by the collateral of the uh, first die that was like that's now frozen, and one week later, right, when it unfreezes, right, when optimism or arbitrum or any of these rollups have reached finality, right, now the maker system just burns that die, right, and so now we have kind of equilibrium again.
right? So it's, it's not constrained by liquidity. There's no fees and it's instant. And best of all, it's, it's trustless. It's completely decentralized. It doesn't have any additional trust requirements on Maker uh, than you would have um, by, by using DAI. Wow, and that's the zoom, zoom, zoom dim view is absolutely amazing. I want to make, make like one or two quick comments. One is that I read this article and they mentioned that a lot of entrepreneurs out there in DeFi that maybe a majority of them are actually like this, right? They think that they propose something that is very meaningful and is useful to the world, but a lot of time they're only proposing this solution that solved the problem that they created, mm -hmm. right? But there's on the other side, the people that are really providing that solution that's make things much more efficient, right? For example, when you are mentioning, you know, um, when someone is using a bridge and obviously you've got to pay the fee and then, but in this case, that's, you know, over here with uh, Maker Teleport that there's no LPs. So there's not, don't necessarily to be, have that one of fee to be paid towards that over there, right? So that's one thing. And another thing is that, you know, kind of curious, how did you and your team or you guys like even, you know, like have, came up with the thought about, you know, like putting the things in place because it just uh, sounds like you guys put a lot of time and a lot of thought into this, right? I'm wondering if there's like um, an epiphany kind of moment that happened then that you guys like, oh, this is it, we got to work on this. Or it come from, you know, months of discussion, years of discussion, and there's, there's some, some wrote and reviewed for you guys naturally, you know? Um, so... I would say Maker is um, probably more on the very slow side of doing anything, right? So um, I think, you know, during Cryptomania, you see some teams iterating extremely quickly, right? And new innovations here and new innovations there and, and experimenting. And, and, and that's, I, I think, one way to, to do it. I think it benefits projects that are kind of at the beginning of their, of their story, right? When they're still trying to make a name for themselves and trying to get traction and trying to get users and attention. Um, but eventually once you uh, mature a little bit as, as an organization, as a project, as a protocol, right? Uh, Maker has billions of dollars, right? As collateral. There are, I think, six or seven billion die in circulation right now. So everything has to be very, very methodical, right? Uh, it, it's not, uh, right, everything, it's like kind of like building a, a spaceship. Building a spaceship versus building like a mobile phone app. If you have a bug in your mobile phone app, the app crashes, right? No big deal. The user just opens up the app again, you know, it's fine. In the spaceship, if there's a bug, right, the spaceship can go boom. Right. Or, you know, it can't uh, finish its journey right back to Earth and the people inside could die. Right. And so when you have a very, very large financial application like Maker, right, that's backed, you know, backing with billions of dollars, you have to be very, very slow and methodical and strategic. Um, so uh, Maker Teleport, you know, on its own is a really cool innovation. Uh, but we've been working on it for probably eight to 12 months, right? Like that's how, you know, long it takes to make really high quality, secure, kind of innovative software. Um, but Maker Teleport was conceived of as part of a larger strategy of making Maker go multi-chain, right? We talked about Maker being on many chains. Well, Maker right now is only on Ethereum, right? We're not on many chains yet. Um, what do we need to be able to go multi-chain? Well, DAI needs to be able to flow freely to other chains first. Once we can do that, then we can build Maker on other chains. And instead of just borrowing on Ethereum and letting people transfer from Ethereum to Arbitrum, right? they can just borrow on Arbitrum directly. So, so it's really part of, it's like a keystone piece that's needed right, to get to the next step. right? And, and so everything becomes very, very methodical. 
with the downside being that it's it's very slow, right? I, I think Maker is probably not known for being super innovative, right? You know, we've been out for quite a few years now and everyone's like, oh, da, yeah, I know that. I know how it works, right? But it's it's you you have to be. You can't do anything fast. If you want to, if you want to, uh, you know, blow up like a, a UST or something, right? You do things fast. If you want to be really safe, you do things extremely slowly and extremely methodically.